live from the Javits Center in New York City, it's theCUBE, covering Inforum 2017. Brought to you by Infor. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Inforum 2017. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We're joined by Debbie Krupitzer. She is the Vice President at Capgemini, based in San Francisco. Thanks yes. so much for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. It's your first time on theCUBE, so we're going to... It is, I'm excited. It's, it's going to be great. Great. It's going to be great. So, so Capgemini has had a, a long-standing relationship with Infor, uh, but this year things got a little more serious. So, it did. so t tell, give us a status update. I think we both saw the writing on the wall, which is around, you know, MySpace is digital manufacturing, that's where I play, and they see it too, right? So we see such a great opportunity around connected factory and enterprise asset management, and all these really good things that are happening in the space, and so it sort of naturally came together. So we've always worked with them, but we really saw an opportunity for this year saying, hey, this is an investment piece. We both have a lot of energy, a lot of passion around it. Let's go make this happen. So it's been super fun, lots of fun this week. AI is, has been a really big theme at this conference with right. the introduction of Coleman. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where Capgemini is putting its resources when it yeah. comes to artificial intelligence? Absolutely, I mean we know it's the future. We know it's where it's at. So, um, and you know I had a quote from Elon Musk which was saying AI, they're taking over the world, robots are going to take over the world from us in about 45 years. I don't know if that's so much true, but what we are really focused on is the business value of AI, not the sort of trend or what's so, you know, the hype of AI, where can you practically use it? So uh, for us, artificial intelligence could be consumer feedback, or it could be around machines. It could be, you know, where are we getting machines to talk to us to tell us what's wrong? We see a ton of opportunity around this, and it's really exciting for us, but always with that pragmatic, you know, what's going to make us money, what's going to save us money and our customers. That's what we're always focused on. So it's the business value. Always the business value. The technology hype is just the technology hype, and I think that's what we really love about this conference is that there's a practicality about it. So there's not this sort of, hey, it's trendy, it's cool, let's just go do it. There's a lot of thought behind it. There's a lot of thought behind what we want to do, what we want to achieve, and what we want to invest in, and we so, see this as a big investment. So we're going to talk about people, process, and technology yeah. on theCUBE. Everybody always says technology is the easy part, and I think it's generally <laughs> true. I mean, technology is generally well understood. There's a lot of open source stuff. Yep. Pretty much everybody has access to generally the same, the same technology. It's how they apply it, the processes they put behind it, and the people that right. really make the difference. Okay, so when you think about digital manufacturing, help us understand it. It's not, certainly not my wheelhouse. Yeah. You're bringing the, the IT and the whole IOT thing, you're bringing yep. the IT and the operations technology worlds together. And yep. those are worlds that have never really collided, you got have they? It, yeah. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little I would bit. Love some to. of the it's sort of challenges that Oh, that and there's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So we call it the IT-OT convergence. So mm -hmm. there's actually a name for it. So that's operational technology and informational technology. And you're right, the plant has always been its own kingdom. So whenever you think of manufacturing, these plants are like, we are the kings, we do it the way we want, and they never really wanted IT involvement. But what we're finding is that the CFOs, the people who are spending the money, have already seen the value of IT in terms of cloud, cost savings, enterprise, infrastructure. How do you apply those to the plant to get the savings and how do you replicate it? So what we're finding is that there's always, again, there's a cost factor, right? So they're going, can, is there a way for us to leverage technologies across multiple plants where we can get those savings versus plants just going by and whatever they want? And that's what we're seeing as the big change. Now, you're always going to get a shift because you know our plant guys and girls, you know, they're used to doing it the way they want. But the thing that we see is that we're not coming in and totally putting robots to replace these jobs. What we're coming in is making their jobs easier. We're making it more efficient. We're seeing ways to save them money. And so the plants get incented when they have outcomes where they save money. So they're really pretty interested in doing this too. So give us some examples mm. of a robot working alongside of someone on a factory floor. So, you know, it's funny, but I'd say 80% of the companies we work with don't have robots. Robots are sort of the sexy, cool thing that everybody thinks is out there, and they are out there, and they're really cool. But normally with the robots, it's already highly processed. It's a highly structured environment, usually around high tech or the car companies. I'll tell you what's more for me, where they don't have anything, where it's still paper-based. That's more fun, because what you're doing is going in and showing them how you can add a sensor to a machine to give you information you've never had before. How can this tell us how to do something differently? Is there a process issue? And when you talked about technology always being the easy part, it really is. When we go into a factory, it's normally a people 
people challenge, and that's operator, whether the operator's not doing something correctly or in the right sequence, it's process. Is there a process challenge? The technology is normally the easy part. So for me, I'm that person who likes that the really immature factory, because that to me is where you make the most change. Somebody who's already got robots, you're already doing cool stuff. I'm probably not going to show you too much. It's the ones where they have that aha moment, where they go, wow. And we've, and we've been hearing this, that a lot of this stuff is change management. Yes. So how, as, uh, as from the Capgemini perspective, how do you approach these, these challenges? You know, you want to get always executive buy-in, right? So it's when it's coming from the top, I think that always is really valuable. But for us, we're plant floor people. I mean, I say, you've got to go talk to these folks and make them understand why you're doing it and what you're doing. Because there's always fear, right? Fear in anything. Fear it's going to take your job or fear you're not going to have a job. And what we're saying is it's a reallocation. The fact is this, is that in our space, we've got an aging workforce. An aging workforce is going away. And the millennials don't want to work a factory floor. And the reason they don't want to work a factory floor, it's dirty or they don't think it's the kind of work that we want to do. We're trying to modernize that. Use an iPad, get IOT, get technology. You're not working the plant floor, you're working a dashboard. You're looking at data, you're driving data decisions. And so we call it from shop floor to top floor. You know, how can we drive that? So our millennials, the ones who really, we want these guys to be and girls to be taking these jobs. How can we make it more exciting for them? And we think there's a good opportunity for that. So it really is all about the data and Always. when you think about sort of the factory floor, a lot of analog data. And then you talk about process, a lot of process that's changing as a result of that yep. sort of analog to digital. So can you talk about the the data, the data architecture Absolutely. that you're seeing and that what the discussion is around data, data value, how to get value, how to monetize data, not necessarily by selling the data directly, right. but how it contributes to revenue generation or cost cutting. Well, we say, you know, data is the new oil, right? But I always tell my, my clients, it's new oil, but it's not refined oil. And you've got to refine it. And refining the oil or refining the data is finding the business value out of that data. And you're right, there's a lot of data out there. The questions that we get from the manufacturers are, what data is valuable? What is not valuable? What do I need? What do I not need? What can I aggregate up? I think the most interesting thing, and I love stories, is that you know when you look at a line, you've got machine number one to machine number 10. And before, they would never know that something that was happening on machine number one, even a small configuration or change in a widget, was actually impacting machine number 10. They never had that before. Now with that data, we're taking the data off of those singular machines, we're putting it up into the cloud, we're aggregating it, we're able to see these anomalies that go, wow, that's the reason why. We never had that before. So you'd have engineers that would go, what well, must be machine number 10 or must be machine number nine or we don't really know what's going on. Now we're able to trace that. That's great. So I wonder if you could share with us any insights you have around discussions going on around IP and data ownership because Imagine this hypothetical example, you've got some kind of programmable logic controller and the right. P PLC manufacturer is collecting data because yep. they're trying to do predictive maintenance or whatever it is and then of course the factory is the whole system and they're right. collecting data. And so who owns that oh, data such a good and, question. and what's that conversation well, like? Well, I'm no lawyer so I'm not going <laughs> to get into it. So I think, uh, I think what you'd find is that um, it, it depends, and that's a consultant answer, but I'm going to say it depends. If you're talking about the machine data, you have bought machines that are from a manufacturer. The manufacturers would love to have that machine data because they want to know what's going on with their machines. You want to know what's going on with the machine on the floor, a very specific use case, which is what's happening in my space. The manufacturers want to know what's going on in a general way. How do we make our product better? How are our customers using it? In my mind, a plant shouldn't mind about that. A manufacturer wants to get that data to make better product, faster to market, make it cheaper, easier to buy. Great, take it. I think where you get challenges is when there's outcomes that are coming out of data that people are leveraging to resell as business models. I think that's where people go, but that's our proprietary customer information about how we do a specific process or how we do something. I think that's where people get a little iffy. And I don't really see that happening so much, so much, right? And I get everybody is really scared about the cloud. I think the interesting thing is they'll say, well, we don't want all of our data, proprietary data in the cloud because it's not secure. And what I want to tell them, it's more secure in the cloud than it is at your plant. So that's, that's I'm less concerned about the, the security of the cloud. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's different and you got to do some extra work to figure it out. I'm, we're more concerned with our clients around Kind of the other thing that we're talking about, and I'll, I'll ask it specifically. If I'm using some kind of AI and I'm developing a, a model and I'm using yes. machine learning, 
and I'm training that model, maybe it's my data, uh, but the model, I'm, my data is informing that model. How right. do I know that that model is not, somehow that IP of mine is not going to end up at my competitors? And is that going into discussions and it contracts is. and agreements? And Absolutely it is. And I think what you'll find is a lot of vendors that are out there that are dealing with AI and data are having to set clauses up that say, you will not use this data to feed into any of your algorithms, into your IP. Like, do not take my data, because everyone thinks what we do is special, and some of it may be. Do not take that and learn from us. And that's very specific in clauses and contracts that we're And saying. is it kind of like the honor system? Or is there, any kind of, is there a digital way to track is that? It, yeah, well, I mean, I think what's getting interesting is we get the data, like, the, the companies aren't done, right? They're hiring their own data scientists. They're not letting this go to external parties. They're saying, we're going to hire our own data scientists and we'll start segmenting the data for you. They're very clever. They, you know, business people are in business because they know how to make money. They're not <laughs> dumb. Um, so what they're doing is getting a whole new set of roles. They're hiring data scientists. They're hiring data architects. They're hiring people in that understand the data structures so that they can keep track of what's valuable and what's not, don't worry about it. So, and I think that's a smart thing to do because it used to be pretty rogue. I mean, five years ago, right? People would be like, well, I don't care if you take the data off the machine. I think people have gotten a lot more clever and also seeing that, you know, some of the vendors are repurposing some of this data for their own profit. Nobody wants that. Don't take my stuff and use it to profit yourself. And you're talking about earlier just the idea of what's valuable data and what's not valuable data. And we frankly are in this deluge of data. Yes. And we don't even really know, You're we right. can't say for certain that data is not valuable, so right. don't worry about it. Exactly, and I think that's the challenge we get, is that everybody thinks it's like a pile of money. Like, that's money, <laughs> don't get rid of that money. It's You're oil. It's oil, <laughs> don't get rid of that, right? But what we find is some of it, you're getting so much data. Some of the data is really not as valuable. And I'll give an example. An on-off switch and telling me that the motor is running on a machine is not valuable. It doesn't matter. It matters to that company because they need to know that the machine is working. So what we want to do is segment data and we want to be able to give the business value or have a hypothesis around what that data is bringing us. And sometimes, I'll tell you, a lot of times the hypothesis for my business users is wrong. So they'll say like, well we think if A and B it's super valuable, and then we'll go in and we're like, actually it's not A and B, it's E. E is actually the data stream that actually has the most value for you, and this is why. And so that to me is the really fun part. So they have, they've got to have that moment where they go, oh, well we were wrong about that. And what's it? I say you're not wrong, it's just different. So I think having that data and then understanding you know, what you're holding on the edge, what you're putting on cloud, what you're putting on prem, what you're able to share, it just makes people smarter about what they've got. So the accounting industry doesn't have standards as to how to value data on a balance sheet. No. We know that. Um, but are there off-balance sheet discussions Ooh. going on that you're having with your clients in terms of helping them understand the value of their data, quantifying that value? Everybody talks about, you know, the data is the new oil, you got to yeah. be a data-driven company, all this sort of, you know, commentary. Well, but how do you turn that into actionable, you know, tangible, your results. That's the hard part, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's the meat of the problem. And I think what we do is we really have to deep dive with our clients to understand like, what's the business model or what do they think is going on? Because we've had lots of byproduct data that's come off of certain, you know, certain things that they had and we're like, this is actually a more interesting tangent here which is a byproduct of that data that you've got. Have you guys thought about selling that? So we'll come in and come up with business models. And so Cap Gemini has got, you know, we've got Cap Consulting, we have these great acquisitions that we've just made where they'll come in and we've got you know, people that just do that, to say, this is a new business model, have you thought of a resale, or this is something that's very valuable, and we'll go in and deep dive. A lot of times it's just discovery. We don't know either. Um, so we'll go in and sort of say, okay, this looks interesting, have you thought about this, and just new ways, it's new business models. Do you, do you see organizations, and are you helping organizations, uh, actually apply yeah, maybe conventional financial measure, whether it's NPV yep, or enterprise always. value, and, and are they beginning to track that, and, and what, if, what can you share it's with so us? It's so funny you said that, because I just my, I just was uh, uh, coming here and I had a lead, I had a hot lead, but I had to leave and come and do this <laughs> interview, and he was asking me, and I said the one thing we do is value map your processes and your data. 
And it was the thing that intrigued him. He's like, how do you do that? How are you doing that? I'm like, well what we're doing is actually we take all of your data from a historical standpoint and we can see what's going on historically. Now the interesting part is how do you go forward with that? And so what we're finding is that, you know, you look at this data and you say, what's the value mapping in terms of where you make money? And that's different for every, com every company. So we work with our customers. So literally what I do is plot. Here's this process, there might be 15 processes that are going on. Here's the data of the outcome of that process. Now you talk to me about the value value in terms of where you guys make the most money. You know, that's interesting because you know, data has unique value for different processes obviously, you so you it. have to understand those depend, it's not fungible like a dollar bill. Uh, and so that's what you can do is share this video with your hot prospect. <laughs> you know, exactly. Maybe yeah, exactly. start a deeper conversation. I did, you know? I told him, I said, I have to go, but I'll be back. So <laughs> hopefully he's still warm over there. But I think people don't realize that, that, that the value mapping that you do is really a standard value, like you said, standard financial models, uh, you know, the net present value, all those things, ROI, all those things we've always traditionally done on every project, we do the same exact thing with us for around digital manufacturing because what we want to do is optimize. We want to optimize on what's going to save you the most money or make you the most money. And it's really that simple. Does it save you money? Does it make you money? So you're applying sort of conventional measures to data, mapping yep. that to processes and then driving business outcomes and then quantifying that over a life cycle. You got it. Yeah. That's exactly it. So you gave away my secret. So now you're going to start a well, consulting Well, but no, firm. so that's <laughs> high level. Sounds good, but it's not trivial to do that. It, you need expertise, really you need you domain do. expertise. You do, right? and every manufacturer is different, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I work in discrete and process manufacturing. Very different, very different processes, very different ways. You know, process manufacturing has a little bit more complexity, not that discrete doesn't, but, you know, it's interesting because what we do is find different things for I different industries too, right? Now, now, there's some comparables, like food and pharma, food processing pharma is very similar, and people don't realize mm. that, but it's very similar. And so we're always making comparisons. Pharma's a little bit more regulated. I think that might scare people, right? Because they want their food to be really regulated. <laughs> it is regulated, <laughs> but maybe not as regulated maybe as your not. drugs. <laughs> so, um, but what we find is the hypothesis or use cases that we can leverage and repurpose across industries. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in an industry, and I just had one, and it was automotive, and I gave them a consumer packaging use case where they looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, I don't get it. And I connected the dots for them. And I said, do you see where if you've got this in consumer packaging, which they're looking at, the quality of the packaging from start to finish, and I gave them the, you know, I won't go into the detail, but they had this, they, they just went, oh yeah. And so I think what we're finding is industries, it used to be like, if you don't know automotive, if you don't know mining, There's if you no don't overlap. know consumer packaging, so you don't know us. Mm. You don't know and, us. And that's changed. And that's completely. changed. So what they're seeing is they're going, you know what? Because they're seeing like the Amazons. They're seeing these companies, you know, Amazon just bought Whole Foods, what? Right. Why? And they didn't buy Whole Foods for the grocery, they bought them for the data. And so I say like, guys, think of this in a different way. You've got to look at other industries. And so we're getting that more and more. We'll, you know, we'll bring them out to have discussions about innovation or what's new cool technology. And I bring it from every sector. Now, and most of the time they'll go, show me how that's applicable. And I'll show them and they go, wow. That's a great observation. Yeah. I mean, because, yeah. you're, you're, because digital means data and data you means you it. can traverse industries in new ways. That, right. So I love that CPG example, right? You would think, what? Yep. But you're getting people to rethink. You really are, and they're seeing, they're like, model. you know, they've got to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, companies are having to reinvent themselves in this digital age, and, and they're scared. And they're saying, like, we sell a commodity, what can we do differently? How are we going to survive? I don't want to be the Kodak. I don't want to be the Blockbuster. I don't want to be that company. And so we're, you know, we're constantly pushing our product companies, like, well, what are you doing different? What, how are you going to the next level? Is it data? Is it services? What Where business you are you in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? I mean, exactly. Well, it's causing people to rethink business. that. I mean, it was sort of, you know, we're back to the what business are you really you in got question. It. You got it. Like we were 20 years ago. It really is. Yeah. It just cycles, right? And I say, it, everything cycles around. We're doing the same thing. We just repackage it and call it something else. So, but we all do the same well, thing. Well, but there are some differences, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. The, 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 More technology, better yeah. technology, cheaper technology, I think is what I'm finding, is that the price of, sensors and the price of technology is going down, that it's becoming more affordable. So what I used to hear from my manufacturers is like, well I can't afford that, we can't do that, because they're very lead margins in 
manufacturing. I mean, there's a lot going on and we're being able to show them like, hey, it's not a ton of investment. This isn't like a $20 million ERP, small increments of money that show you how to get the same. Well, between 20 years ago, you were purpose building specific technology stacks for your customers and today you're leveraging, whether exactly. it's cloud, a security layer, a data layer. You got I mean, it. You pick it, you're building on top of this digital matrix. Absolutely. Really I mean, focused on the business models, more is. so than the technology. It is, and that's what we're seeing. And I say, that's why to get back to the first question about the OT, IT convergence, mm -hmm. that's what my CFOs see. They go, we get it, we get it. Now let's apply it to the plant. So let's go see how we can scale this. Because you're talking you know, anywhere from uh, companies having 20 plants to 200 plants, that's a lot. And they want to see how they can repeat and scale. And so that's what we love about it. It's turning into a business conversation. It's not a technology conversation, which I love. Debbie, thank you so much for thank joining you. us on theCUBE. You, thank you. You made it. <laughs> I did it, yay, I got it. Thank you so much. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. We will have more from Inforum just after this.